Well, it's no wonder that the apostles, the leaders of the new Christian church, simply called the way, uh, they didn't trust Saul's apparent conversion. Saul's involvement in persecuting Christians began with the stoning of Stephen, the first martyr in Jerusalem, where Saul took charge of, of holding the robes of the Jews who were stoning Stephen to death. You can find the story in Acts 7. That's sort of like here. Let me hold your coat while you throw that rock. The stoning of Stephen set off a major persecution of the Christians in Jerusalem, an onslaught in which Saul ended up being a major player. It says on that day, a great persecution arose against the church in Jerusalem, and they were all scattered throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria. No longer content with being on the sidelines, it says that Saul began ravaging the church, entering house after house, and dragging off men and women to be beaten or killed. So we can understand why Ananias, whom the Lord was sending to speak to Paul, expressed great apprehension. He knew well Saul's reputation. Acts 9 verses 10 to 13 could be paraphrased basically as, Lord, you got to be kidding. This guy, this guy is the one who's been hunting and killing us. <sighs> but Ananias did as the Holy Spirit instructed him and he went to the house where Saul was staying. They had to be thinking, was this a trap? What was God thinking to be sending him right to the butcher's door? <laughs> but inside he finds not a monster, but a frail and distraught man who's had a catastrophic, life-changing experience. He's been blinded by the light of Jesus, the risen Lord, and he's been sitting for three days in the dark until he, he gets how blind he has been all along. When Ananias lays hand on this man who has been the cause of so much suffering among the believers, I wonder if just for a moment he was tempted to, to beat him or, or maybe even kill him. Certainly, there would have been many among the followers of the way who would have not blamed him one bit for inflicting a little retribution when the opportunity arose. But God's spirit had also told Ananias that this man, this man was being chosen for a kind of special work in bringing others to know Jesus. Unbelievable. Now there might've been just a tiny bit of satisfaction in the rest of the divine message that Saul would suffer greatly in the fulfillment of this special work to which he was being called. Anyone would be forgiven for thinking a silent good. Some justice would be done at least. Nothing offends us more than the bad guys getting away with murder in this case, real murder. We want justice to be done. Well, maybe Ananias recalled Deuteronomy 32 verse 35 and took some comfort in it. It was a verse that Saul himself would have known very, very well. <laughs> Ironically, he quotes it in his letter to Romans chapter 12. It goes like this, beloved, Never avenge yourselves, but leave it to the wrath of God, for it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. What we do know is that from the moment Ananias lays hands on Saul, he is a new man. Scales drop from Saul's eyes. He is changed. He can see things in a different way. He stays with the disciples in Damascus for a while, and then he is eager to meet the leaders in Jerusalem and tell them what an amazing thing has happened to him on the day that he met Jesus. I guess we've all 
found that sometimes in our enthusiasm for what has given us new meaning and purpose in life, we can be totally stunned by the negative pushback that we receive from others, others who have known us for a long, long time. We expect them to be overjoyed at this new optimism that we feel, the certainty that this time will be different. And so we're surprised and hurt when all they express is doubt. They say to each other, if not to your face, can a leopard change his spots? They don't believe that this change will stick. They aren't getting excited or celebrating this moment as you had hoped. No, they're predicting failure or worse. I wonder if Saul expected to be greeted by the leaders of Jerusalem's church with open arms. Surely the followers of Jesus would rejoice that enemy number one had laid down his weapons and decided to join them, wouldn't they? He ought to have not been surprised though by the chilly reception that he received. Someone wrote this about that first meeting between Paul and the apostles in Jerusalem. Imagine you are a Christian living in the Soviet Union during the time of the Communist Party. Just as the party was intent on destroying churches and synagogues and mosques, forcing the faithful to go underground to worship. Believers, if discovered, were ridiculed or harassed or incarcerated and sometimes even executed. According to some sources, the total number of Christian victims under the Soviet regime has been estimated to range somewhere between 12 to 20 million. We know at least 106,300 Russian clergymen were confirmed as having been executed during the Great Purge, and that's only the tip of the iceberg. Given that background, imagine you were at a secret worship service and one of your members brought in a new believer who happens to be a KGB officer you knew by his brutal reputation. Would you trust him? Would you always wonder if he was a plant, a mole, who was just waiting to set up the arrest and the execution of everyone in the church? Words are just words. I expect you would always harbor the fear that this dangerous beast would never change and would always remain a threat. So it was with the leaders and the congregation in Jerusalem. You know, the old warning, if it seems too good to be true, it likely is. It would be great if enemy number one stopped hounding them. Well, that's true. But it took a long, long while for everyone to accept that Saul's conversion was indeed genuine. He could change his name to the more Gentile sounding version, Paul, but the Jerusalem church folks continued to judge him by his past. Paul had to go out into new territory, face many threats and danger, and yes, he had to willingly suffer for his faith in Jesus before they would believe him. It took ages before anybody could say that they trusted Paul. I don't know if they ever forgave him though. That would have been very, very hard to do, I think. But all along, Paul kept insisting that he had changed. It wasn't just his name. He had changed. He was different. 
not because some logical argument had convinced him that he had been wrong. No, it, it was only meeting Jesus that could so turn his life upside down and inside out. Saul had been a very dedicated Jewish legal expert. He was a Pharisee's Pharisee, a super believer in the Torah, a diligent upholder of God's law, and not just in his own practice, but actively policed the ritual lives of anybody and everybody as well. He was a Jewish fundamentalist and he believed that his response to the Christian threat was not only justifiable, it was absolutely correct. Saul didn't persecute Christians because he was evil. He rounded them up to be tortured and executed because he believed he was good. He was doing God's cleanup work. Only God's own spirit could convince him that he was all wrong. We might today call Saul's experience on the road to Damascus a psychotic break from reality. He heard things, he saw things, he felt things that the others around him did not. Yet these very things would be the foundation for the new life that would bring him from the collapse of, of everything he had done and build him to the, the, the new life that was waiting for him in service to Jesus. Paul called himself an apostle. Now was a term reserved only for those who had known Jesus when he was alive. Even though he received pushback from Peter and the others about it, Paul insisted that he had earned that title fair and square when his life had been so changed by a face-to-face -face meeting with the risen Jesus. Now, this is a very important point. It's more than just semantics. Paul is saying that everything he is now is only possible because of Jesus. It's not because of his decision or his willpower. Only Jesus has the power to change that leopard's spots. The good news is that power is available to each person today. Anyone who has been defined by their past needs to know this. Once someone believes they are what they have been labeled, whether it's by themselves or whether it's by others, it can become a spiraling journey to destruction. If you are constantly told that you're useless, that you're fat, that you're a drunk, that you're never going to amount to anything, that you're stupid, or that you're ugly, or you're lazy, you're weak, or you're too old. Well, if you're told these things over and over and over again, and you let them take control of your mindset, define who you are, it can lead to building enormous barriers that will hold you prisoner for the rest of your life. You see, the way life works is not simply that if we wish for change or want change, it'll happen. No, the only way I truly believe that we can escape this spiral of self-loathing and self-destruction is by meeting the unflinching gaze of Jesus. He will not look away in disgust or disappointment, but that look will be full of love and compassion. He'll tell you that you are beloved and that you are not defined by anything that went on before. From that moment on, you are born a new person with a new future ahead of you. And you'll have God's strong presence to remind you 
that every day is a new day. You are not all the times that you have given up or have let others down or have been drunk or lied or behaved badly. God doesn't see you that way and God hasn't given up on you. I think this is an important message for people who have people in their lives who have had those kind of difficulties. It's important for you to know that with God's help, people really, really can change. My friend Carrie Ann shared this on Facebook earlier this week, and it pretty much sums up what I've said here today. One day, Paul was killing Christians. The next day, he was a Christian. One day, Peter was a fisherman. <laughs> On the next day, he was a fisher of men. Don't judge someone or yourself based on just one day. If, as many believe, God can create the whole world in six days, surely God can create a new heart in one Today is a new day. It's a perfect day for a change of heart. Only God's love and power can change our spots. We leopards know, <laughs> in fact, we trust <laughs> and we proclaim that, when, that what Jesus said is absolutely true, that nothing is impossible for God. Amen. Now, next week, I'll be sharing the story of Corrie ten Boom's meeting with one of the cruelest Nazi prison guards who found her after the war and asked her for her forgiveness. She needed to dig deep to believe that God could really change someone, even someone as awful as him. Stay tuned for part two of our theme, Believing the Unbelievable and Forgiving the Unforgivable.